Is our microphone on here? Can you hear me? Good. All right. Let me uh, start out by uh, thanking uh, all of the uh, witnesses who will be speaking today and all the members of the public who are uh, here uh, to listen to a uh, joint hearing of uh, two committees of the State Assembly, uh, the Committee on Corporations, Authorities, and Commissions, uh, chaired by myself, uh, Assemblymember Jim Brennan, and my colleague, uh, Chair Robin Schiminger of the uh, Committee on Economic Development, Job Creation, Commerce, and Industry. Uh, we're going to have a long day. Um, we have many witnesses. Uh, we have many legislators. Uh, the, uh, they are, we have meaningful and significant and uh, controversial uh, topics to discuss. Uh, it will probably not be um, possible to explore every single issue in depth, uh, but um, everyone who wishes to testify will certainly have that opportunity. Uh, I just have a few opening remarks. Um, and I believe uh, Mr. Schiminger and perhaps uh, other colleagues will have uh, some remarks as well. We're joined by uh, uh, our ranker, Assemblywoman Jane Corwin from Western New York. We have Assemblymember Rodnice uh, Bichat of Brooklyn, Assemblymember Addie Russell uh, from uh, uh, the North Country, uh, Assemblymember Steve McLaughlin from uh, the Capital Region, Assemblymember Neely Rojic from Queens, and uh, Robin, can you do the honors over on the other side there? Uh, surely. I mean, surely. in relation to <laughs> introducing our colleagues. Because I believe in the empowerment of members. I would like the members to self-identify. That's fine. OK. <laughs> Just say your name. OK. <laughs> Ray Walter, I'm the ranking minority member on the uh, uh, committee on um, Economic Development, Job Creation, Commerce, and Industry. Eric Delon, a Democratic Assembly member from Brooklyn. Assemblyman Michael Samanowitz from Queens. Very good. Do you feel <coughs> empowered now? Uh, yes. It's coming to Lulu. Anyway, uh, this is a hearing on uh, providing affordable and high quality cable, broadband, and telephone service. Uh, New York has seen a dramatic uh, growth and change. Uh -huh with new uh, telecom products, technologies, and services. These changes have affected both wireless and wireline providers. Today's hearing focuses on wireline cable, broadband, and telephone. These services, broadband in particular, uh, play a, an important role in people's everyday lives. Uh, broadband has become a, uh, dr a significant uh, uh, and absolute necessity for families of all incomes and is essential for a healthy and vibrant economy and to deliver high quality and affordable broadband that all New Yorkers deserve. Uh, lawmakers and the Public Service Commission will have to explore many different uh, possible uh, mechanisms to uh, assure that that uh, benefit uh, is provided to all. Uh, by the same token, uh, the uh, traditional landline telephone service, which has provided uh, generations of New Yorkers and Americans uh, high quality uh, phone service uh, remains uh, an essential uh, service that needs to be both universal and affordable. Uh, and as the technology uh, evolves, um, the uh, preservation and existence of the copper network and how the fiber network uh, that is being invested in will affect that copper network and how it how that copper network can be preserved and the landline system and plain old telephone service can be preserved are also of great significance. Uh, the Public Service Commission has just completed a uh, review of a uh, merger application between Time Warner Cable and Charter and that merger application was just recently approved, still subject to FCC approval and there are certainly some uh, positive elements to the conditions uh, uh, for the approval of the merger. And uh, certainly, uh, we will need to be sending clear signals to cable, broadband, and telephone providers uh, in the future about how, uh, uh, how to uh, reach the goals of affordable and universal 
service and all of these different elements of telecommunications. Uh, co consumers are going to need to have a choice of at least two providers for the future in relation to broadband and at a certain uh, basic level, perhaps 25 megabits per second uh, in terms of uh, adequate competition. So that's something that we need to be taking a look at. So I hope that uh, today's hearing will uh, fully explore the current and future state of the telecom marketplace, and I look forward to uh, the testimony of many of our participants. Mr. Scheminger. I certainly want to uh, welcome all of my colleagues who are here for this very well attended hearing, and I want to welcome everyone watching online <coughs> or on assembly television. Certainly among all of you people, today must be somebody's birthday, and I certainly wish you a happy birthday, whoever you may be. Uh, this is a well-timed hearing, and I credit Jim Brennan for that. It was, it was just last year that we enacted a change in our public service law requiring, in 2014, two years ago, requiring that in the case of a merger, acquisition of stock, that there be a test applied, a new test, called the public interest. And that test was just applied 12 days ago by the Public Service Commission in evaluating the Charter Time Warner merger. They issued their order, as Jim Brennan said, just 12 days ago on January 8th. And on that same day, the uh, New York State uh, Department of Economic Development, Empire State Development Corporation, issued the guidelines for a half billion dollar program that we, the legislature with the governor, enacted last year to provide state grants to assist in expanding access and shrinking the digital divide. We all know about the digital divide. Certainly there are benefits to greater access, and that's the digital dividend that comes about when more kids can do their homework at home when more New Yorkers can get health information online, when more people can feel connected. So this is an important issue for people and an important issue for economic development. In many ways, broadband is at least the background, maybe even the backbone in which economic development occurs. So with that having been said, I'll turn it back to our senior chair, Jim Brennan. Uh, thank you. Uh other members like to make an opening statement? No? All right. Well, then we'll go forward. Uh, our first uh, members of the of a panel are uh, staff members with the New York State Public Service Commission. We have Kimberly Harriman, uh, General Counsel, and Karen Geduldig, uh, Director of the Office of Telecommunications of the Department of Public Service. Uh, welcome, and uh, I look forward to your testimony, and I think it's being distributed now, and uh, so uh, please go forward. Good morning, Chairs Brennan and Schiminger, and distinguished members of the Assembly. My name is Karen Godaldig, and I was recently appointed the Director of the Office of Telecommunications at the Department of Public Service. With me today is Kimberly Harriman, the Department's General Counsel and I appreciate the opportunity to discuss with you the transformation taking place in the telecommunications industry and government's role in making sure that consumers' evolving demands are met, that consumer protections are in place, and that innovation continues in the industry. As you know, the Public Service Commission is charged by law with ensuring access to telephone service that is just, reasonable, and adequate. But a review of telecommunications policy must consider the changed and changing nature of the telecommunications marketplace. The rapid evolution of technology, spurred by the rapid evolution of the internet, is changing the fundamental concepts of communications. To be sure, the Federal Communications Commission recently adopted its open internet order, and through it reclassified broadband as a regulated telephone service. It is this revolution of the communications industry our consumers' increasing appetite for innovative technologies and industry's response to that appetite, as well as the changing paradigms at the regulatory level that brings us here today. Governor Cuomo recently made two announcements that highlight how government can and should respond to these changes in the telecommunications industry. 
First, Governor Cuomo announced the PSC's conditional approval of the merger between Time Warner Cable and Charter Communications. And he also announced the launch of the nation's largest and most ambitious state broadband initiative. Regarding the merger, in 2014, Governor Cuomo recognized the need for immediate steps to advance the rapid deployment of advanced communications technologies in New York State. Accordingly, Governor Cuomo, with you and your, with, with you, the legislature's help, passed the law that strengthened the Public Service Commission's cable review standards. The new standard requires cable companies seeking merger approval to demonstrate to the PSC that the transaction is in the public interest, whereas before, it just needed to establish that there was no harm. Under this standard, the PSC carefully examined the Time Warner Charter merger petition and approved the merger subject to enforceable conditions that result in value, benefits, and investments to New York State in excess of $1 billion. The conditions require increase in speed sixfold, build out of infrastructure to reach the unserved and underserved of New York, and the state's first low-income broadband program. In addition, the enforceable conditions require investments and improvements to customer service and job protections. On the same day Governor Cuomo announced this historic approval, he also launched through the new New York Broadband for All program, the largest and most ambitious state broadband initiative in the nation, to ensure that New Yorkers have access to high-speed internet by the end of 2018. Together, these announcements secure New York's position as a leader in innovation, technology, and advancement. But they also show that testament to just how fast telecommunications is changing and how important it is for stakeholders to work together to advance public policy goals. The department recognized the need to investigate the changing marketplace before the merger petition was filed. And in May 2014, the department launched a comprehensive examination and study of the telecommunications industry in New York. The ongoing study has generated a comprehensive factual assessment of the technologies available today, including fiber to the premises, wireless, and wireline technologies. The factual assessment importantly addresses how New York consumers are adopting those technologies. And the ongoing study has also included a variety of opportunities for public participation, including 15 public statement hearings across nine locations across the state. More than 800 people attended these public statement hearings, making them one of the most successful public outreach efforts in recent years. Additionally, more than 1,000 written public comments have been filed, and dozens of comments from public officials and consumer constituent groups have been accepted. Following are some key themes that have emerged from the factual assessment and the commentary thus far. Consumers are adopting wireless and cable wireline telephony services in significant numbers. Wireless adoption has been outpacing traditional voice services <clears throat> since 2004. And VoIP adoption overtook traditional voice service in 2012. The Lifeline program illustrates this point. Lifeline participants are required to choose between wireline and wireless services. They cannot have both. And consumers are overwhelmingly selecting wireless. There's a little bit more data on this point. A little over a decade ago, New York had 12 million traditional landline connections in service, and today that number is less than 3 million. A little over a decade ago, New York had more than 5 million wireless cell phones in service, and by 2013, that number was close to 21 million. And a little over a decade ago, New York had fewer than 1 million New Yorkers subscribed to telephone service over cable lines. And by 2013, that number was close to 5 million. Another theme of the, broad, of the telecom study to date is around broadband. Broadband is this century's essential service, much like what telephone service was in the second half of the 20th century. The factual assessment estimates that consumers are adopting cable and wireless broadband significantly more than the local exchange carrier provided broadband, despite similar availability. And there's a little bit more data on this point as well. A little over a decade ago, New York had less than 2 million broadband connections serving New York, primarily over telephone and cable systems. By 2013, there are 19 million connections in service provided over a wide range of technology platforms. In addition to these, the increase of broadband and the technologies that support broadband, the digital divide is clearly a concern in terms of availability and affordability. Another common public observation from the telecom study and the commentary thus far is the considerable concern over complaints of the poor quality of Verizon's copper network due to its possible deterioration. 
Similarly, the department has heard from commenters that Verizon should be required to roll out Fios as an alternative to the copper network, and to the contrary, that Fios is not a suitable alternative to the copper network due to perceived reliability concerns. The study also recognizes that competition plays a role both in maintaining affordable prices and service quality and spurring innovation. In response to growing competition in voice services, the Commission and the Legislature previously opted to streamline the regulatory process, thereby reducing regulatory burdens to level the competitive playing field between providers. Regulatory bodies across the country, including in New York, have historically supported competitive markets as an effective approach to promoting investment and innovation and ensuring core regulatory interests and consumers' evolving needs are met. Where competition does not ensure those core interests, however, the Commission continues to act and evolve its regulatory approach. With regard to the telecom study, the Department is taking a phased approach. Phase one of the study resulted in the issuance of the factual assessment. Phase two of the study consisted of gathering public input and identifying issues and concerns for additional study. This phase included the series of public statement hearings and receipt of comments from the public and interested stakeholders. In phase three, the PSC will identify and prioritize areas for policy development and identify the need for additional processes to complete the record. To this end, the PSC recently noticed technical conferences for, to take place in the end of February, the goal of which is to hear from experts in the industry and interested parties about legacy and advanced communication services and to discuss the application of a regulatory framework to those changing services. Phase four will be the department's staff staff's development of regulatory recommendations for further action that may be warranted and determined by the Public Service Commission. Public, in, public involvement, including that of state and local public officials, consumer groups, the telecommunications industry, labor and economic development organizations, and other interested stakeholders has been and will continue to be crucial to charting the right regulatory path for the future. The telecommunications world has gr changed greatly in New York over a relatively short period of time, and the changes have been historic and sweeping. The Commission's goal is to support the continuing evolution and expansion of communications technology to meet the emerging needs of New York consumers and to make sure that those services are safe, reliable, and affordable for citizens from every walk of life. We look forward to partnering with you in this effort. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, do you have a timetable for the uh, completion of the telecommunications study and possible recommendations and policy decisions? We don't currently have a timetable for that. However, we do anticipate that the phase three with the technical conferences will result in some um, concrete areas for where to turn our attentions to next. It's possible that there could be discrete pathways from those technical conferences for further assessment by the commission. Yes, and of course, you know, the part of the point of the question is that I would think that uh, the many stakeholders uh, either it's industry, uh, consumer, labor, uh, the legislature, the general public, and, you know, would um, appreciate uh, decisions at some point as to uh, policies uh, with respect to issues like land landline, uh, further broadband development, <coughs> adequate conditions for competition, service quality, various aspects. So uh, I would just hope that... Um, that uh, there will be an end date uh, at some point, and the Commission will provide some clear policy prescriptions for the future, mm -hmm. and if necessary, work with the legislature on that subject. You know, one, one area where uh, 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 broadband appears to have gotten a, a sort of set of signals as to your policies is the, uh, is the recent merger. And certainly many of the issues in the telecom study are, uh, are the subject of the merger uh, review, and now you have issued a decision. And uh, so, uh, so during the review, uh, the very uh, Time Warner uh, cable and charter and the Public Service Commission staff and ultimately the Public Service Commission itself had, a, uh, had an interplay about the power and the authority of the Commission to direct uh, certain broadband speeds, certain investments, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you issued your order, which 
actually denied the petition unless the uh, Time Warner uh, Cable and Charter agreed to a set of conditions, which they did, right? They agreed to the conditions set forth in the Commission's order, right? Correct. Right. Um, so, so, yes, it's in the public interest that uh, the uh, state of New York outside New York City where it appears that uh, 300 megabits per second broadband is available between Verizon Fios and, uh, and uh, the cable companies to the extent that the Fios product um, you know, is still rolling out, but where it's available, you have that kind of uh, interplay or you have those, uh, those services available. But uh, in the rest of the state, uh, the order says that uh, Time Warner, or I guess it's called New Charter, will um, have to have 100 megabits by 2018, 300 by 2019. So that's good, um, but let me ask you this. Uh, could the Public Service Commission uh, have just directed Time Warner Cable to uh, provide those broadband speeds uh, to the public outside New York City within a certain time frame uh, without necessarily approving the merger itself? So the FCC has made it clear that we are not in a position, meaning the Public Service Commission is not in a position to rate set. What set rates, set pricing for, um, for the services. What we can do is focus on the quality of that service and the question of whether we're looking at the right well, metric. If, if you mind my interrupting you for just a moment. Sure. Um, the, the federal statute says that the states should encourage advanced telecommunications technology, right? That's, mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, Yes, you did that by in the order, but uh, the presumably directing Time Warner Cable or any other cable company or even Verizon to provide those same types of broadband speeds, uh, in and up, regardless of any merger, um, is is creating advanced telecommunications technology. So why do you say you can't do that? So I'll, I'll go ahead and take that assignment. Um, First and foremost, Could you identify yourself. Sorry, it's Kimberly and Harriman. And bring that microphone in front of you. Uh, Kimberly to Harriman, you. general counsel for the Public Service Commission and also general counsel to the Department of Public Service. So, in answer to your question, um, absent a merger review by the commission to determine whether or not that transaction is in the public interest, would the commission have the authority and jurisdiction to direct other cable broadband providers? or other general broadband providers to increase both speed or even availability. And it's not a simple answer, as you can imagine. Um, we do, as you point out, have a federal statute that encourages or calls on the states to encourage the deployment of broadband, first and foremost. Second, as you may be aware, the FCC has designated broadband service as a telecommunication service. And with that designation, they also chose to forbear on certain regulatory functions regarding broadband. So we are in a state of examining what those decisions mean for the commission's jurisdiction independent of merger review um, transactions. And that will be evaluated in the telco study. There is a question as to whether or not broadband is jurisdictional to the commission. Um, but as you know, broadband has evolved and the platforms over which it's being delivered cover regulated services, whether it's a telco facility or a cable facility. I don't know how many of you have triple play, but I do. And it's very hard now to distinguish the two other than standalone situations, but even there where the asset is being utilized to de deliver jurisdictional services, we want to take that really careful look because, as you noted and your colleagues noted, broadband is an essential service. So we're going to be very careful in evaluating the full authority of the commission to ensure we're doing everything we can to bring it to every corner of this state. All right. Uh, so when you say uh, forbear from uh, certain regulatory functions, you mean rate setting? Correct. That was right? one of yeah. the functions. Right. Um, so, so the answer is uh, you're still examining whether or not the commission might have the power to uh, compel additional broadband speeds uh, or not. 
it, it, we are examining it. I will tell you it is, um, it will be a very difficult hurdle to overcome uh, because there is a lack specifically in the PSL with respect to regulation of that service, but I probably wouldn't be doing a very good job as general counsel if I gave up commission jurisdiction at the first instance. No, and no, so, don't give the commission bad, yeah. advice, bad legal advice. Don't <laughs> right. do that. Right? So we're going to look at it. We certainly don't it. want that. Right. Um, all right, so does the, does the commission have a position on what is an adequate level of competition in broadband. So, for instance, thinking about the FCC uh, order or the FCC guiding principle that the nation as a whole, everybody ought to have at least 25 megabits per second. So, um, does, uh, so in New York right now, uh, do what percentage of New Yorkers have that standard? Do you, do you know the 25 megabits, megabits per second broadband? Do you have a sense of what that is? Well, I mean, the governor's goal is for us to reach 100 megabits by the end of 2018, 2019. So when we're talking about where is New York State going, we're using a much more forward-thinking standard about where are the speeds going and what, we're all, what will our consumers and businesses need in the very near future. So I understand that yes. the no, I, I, I understand your point that um, so the the the, uh, the new charter order says that that company will have to provide that speed, but um, as of right now, is there anybody else in upstate New York, outside New York City, mm -hmm. other than where the Verizon FiOS broadband has a franchise? but in the rest of the state, the only entity that might be able to offer 100 megabits or 300 megabits broadband would then become new charter, Time Warner Cable. So, um, uh, so if they're the only entity that can offer that speed, is that adequate competition? Or, or are they a monopoly provider uh, as the only game in town offering that speed? It's a, a very important point on the, on the merger review. And when we did put in that enforceable condition, that new charter apply those speeds across the state, we were, again, looking forward at the needs of New York businesses and consumers in the future. And we do think that that is a benefit for New Yorkers. Did we set the bar higher for the competitors? We did. And traditionally and historically, the, the providers have risen to the occasion and have offered competition where people have upped the ante. To the extent that companies don't ante up and don't meet that very high standard that New York has set, then that is the purpose of the telco study, is to really take a look and see, has the definition of competition changed in light of the demands of our consumers, the demands of our businesses, and the response of the industry? Uh, do you know what the Verizon DSL uh, broadband service, uh, perhaps in conjunction with a wireless router, uh, what broadband speed uh, that technology offers the everyday customer? My understanding is it's 15 to 25. Is that... Uh, yet. We'll let, we'll let the Public Service Commission answer. I do not know that answer. I can, I'm, I'm happy to take that back and get the answer for you, unless there's other members here. Well, if you would uh, uh, accept subject to check that it's in that range, sure. which I think I've, I've read that that's the case, uh, uh, then, um, then uh, you really have uh, kind of this uh, disparate competitive field if new charter offers 100 to 300 within just a few years, but consumers have no uh, alternative with respect to that <coughs> level of speed. Uh, do we have no competition at that point and such that the commission should regulate the price of the Time Warner product? These are precisely the issues that are being addressed in the telco study. It wasn't always, or historically, there were 
if internet provision was considered a competitive service, the question you're asking, which is a really important one, is whether or not it's competition at different speeds. Those are the questions that are being asked at the federal level, and those are the questions that we're asking as well in the telecommunications study. All right, I'm going to ask one more question about um, broadband in relation to this, and then I'm going to get into uh, landline and the copper system and, and fiber system. Uh, are the broadband providers uh, providing pricing data to the commission uh, in relation to its studies, generally speaking? I think in the factual assessment, we did have some pricing data to assess the affordability of the products. Um, the products aren't always apples to apples. They have similar components, and they're not exactly aligned at all times, but the pricing, in pricing information is available in a proprietary, a confidential way to the commission mm -hmm. for the purposes of the factual assessment. All right. Um, if, if Verizon were to uh, uh, retire all or part of the copper network, would it require approval from the Public Service Commission? There is a requirement for approval from the Public Service Commission if the service is to be abandoned and no alternative offered. But how, would, how does that differ from a de facto gradual deterioration that, that some people would say is a de facto abandonment? How would you distinguish between those two? And what would you do if it was the latter? <laughs> 